Good afternoon and namaste. I'm Sujeev Shakya. On behalf of the organizers, very happy to welcome you all here. And I'm very happy to have Gurcharan Das in conversation with Kiran Krishna Shrestha. With Gurcharan, it's about two decades ago when I got to meet him after I read Indian Bound, and that inspired me to write Unleashing Nepal, for which he was very kind enough to write the foreword to the book. And that helped me also to think more and write more. And this journey continues and continues to get inspired by the things he writes and the consistency in which he writes and that what he's been writing for the past 30 plus years. And today I'm very happy to, and honored to host him here. And in conversation is going to be Kiran Krishna Shrestha. And Kiran, another dear friend with whom we have ideated, done a lot of things together. Among the many things he does, he also runs Nepalaya publications that has published two of my books and uh, Nepa Nepatya band, all of us know, uh, that has put Nepali folk into the global map. And of course, Abbas is here, another person who I really admire, a platform called Paleti, which Nepal has produced. So today we are going to have uh, Kiran and Gurcharan talking about this new book of Gurcharan that has just launched very recently, Another Sort of Freedom. And last year when we were in Delhi, he was very passionate that on his 80th birthday, he's going to launch this book. And we had a long conversation and we said we have to do a Nepal launch. And I'm very happy that we are going to do a Nepal launch of this book. So without much ado, may I invite on stage both the speakers, Gurcharan and Kiran on stage. Over to you, Kiran. Namaste, uh, and I'm Namaste. glad to be here. We'll try to keep this conversation very light as the, um, as the writing there goes. We'll not take anything seriously. There'll be no heavy data, which, is you, which Mr. Das is used to, Mr. Gurcharan Das is used to. So we'll try to keep it quite light. Talking about your, because this is your memoir, and um, we'll talk about your identity, because from your book, what I, the first identity that is given to a child is through his mother. So you have quoted your mother's diary and said you've been, at age two, you've, you were uh, considered to be restless. As you grow up, at age four, you are difficult. And then after a certain time, your mother quotes you for being travel, a troublemaker. So which of these childhood traits do you think you still carry along? So um, yes, all three traits. Uh, I began I, at the age of three and a half. Three, I began to run. And I've been running ever since. <laughs> so. You, so it's all three traits that you carry along? Well, I, I, I think so. I think so. There's an, I mean, you'd have thought I'd have slowed down a bit. <laughs> that time you didn't. To slow down. I, it, I, I, I couldn't catch up with you when you were walking around the hotel. So you're still in, the, you're still in good speed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's uh, still difficult to be good, you know. And... Uh, Difficult, uh, in, in, in my book, I talk about an incident which really illustrates the difficulty of being good. So what is the real lifetime difficulty that you face to get to, to that illustrates your life of being, well, being good? Well, the, the, I'm four and a half years old. We are living in model town in Lahore. I'm in, a kin I'm in kindergarten. And there we are in a class of 20 other children. And all of us have pencil boxes, all these two Anna pencil boxes, except the kid next who sits next to me in class. His name is Ayan. Oh, yeah, yes. He's a Muslim boy, and he's poor, and he doesn't have a pencil box. But the kid sitting next to me is a rich kid, the richest kid in our class. He's the only one who comes to school in a car. 
and he has two pencil boxes. And one of the two pencil boxes is red and from England, made in England. So one day during recess, everybody goes out of the class to the playing field and the teacher also leaves. And when I see the classroom is empty, I take the rich kid's pencil box and put it on Ian's desk. Mm -hmm. So after we return from recess, the rich kid screams, who stole my pencil box? And the teacher gets a little worried because he's the richest kid in class. And so we are all made to stand up and go around. She wants to find out who stole the pencil box. And when it comes to Ian's turn, he says, there's a pencil box on my table, but I didn't put it. And then the teacher comes to me next. And I'm frozen. I should have said that I did it. And Ian looks at me, because everybody is now looking at Ian, thinking he has stolen it. And he says, tell them, I didn't do it. Anyway, I'm frozen. And Ian is taken in front of the class, and he's punished. And I have n never been able to understand what happened that day, except to say that it was, must have been temporary insanity. And the same temporary insanity gripped the whole of India, but maybe not all of India, the Punjab in August 1947. This was just a few months later, when in Punjab, we had a partition of India between Pakistan and India. And 20 million people were displaced. And they were neighbors, friends, and they started killing each other. And we, as a family, escaped with our lives, and we were waiting at the train station in Jalandhar, sitting in the train, and the window was open of the train compartment, and I saw a handsome, tall Muslim policeman standing, keeping order on the platform, and suddenly from behind come two sick teenagers with kirpans, and they just kill him. And my mother immediately shuts the window of the train compartment. And that's a symbol of the madness that gripped suddenly. India and Punjab in particular. And the only explanation, even now, I can think of is temporary insanity. The same temporary insanity that gripped me in school, in class, is what gripped the whole state. And uh, there, nobody has been able to come up with an explanation. And we still haven't got a closure to the partition of India. Maybe we have to wait for a great writer. Maybe what Tolstoy did for the Russians in War and Peace to bring a sense of closure after the Napoleonic Wars. Maybe we will have such a writer who will come one day and do that. But meanwhile, it was, it's an event that scarred 
and scarred our lives and uh, and both iron and the muslim policeman are here in my memory till so you, now you have mentioned this in your book and you've talked about waking up at night and thinking about them for for such a long time so it's it must have left a huge scar in your face on on your, in your mind it's uh, talking about uh, iron story that was in lalpur when no, that was in Lahore. That was in Lahore. So before Lahore, you were in Lalpur. Yes. And then you've, you've, uh, you've made many places your home, uh, as per what you have mentioned in your memoir. Is first it was Lalpur, and then which is now Faisalabad. The name has been changed to Faisalabad. Yeah. So you still like to call it Lalpur. You know why it is called Faisalabad? Mm -hmm. Because the Saudis bribed the Pakistanis. Okay. And the Pakist they gave a lot of money to the Pakistanis to teach them Wahhabi Islam in the madrasas. Mm -hmm. And they changed the name of Lalpur, which was named after the Lieutenant Governor of Lahore, of Pakistan, who was called Malcolm Lyle, no, sorry, John Lyle B.A. He always insisted on putting B.A. after his name. And if somebody forgot to do that, they heard about it. Okay, so, so you've uh, you mentioned very dearly about Lyalpur, about Lahore, and then when you came to India, your first home was Shimla, and then you went to and lived where your father was posted to build a dam in Bakra. Bakra, Bakra, Bakra. Dam. And then obviously you were in Delhi, Bombay, and then you went to DC for a while while your father was posted there. You went to Boston to study there, and during your uh, professional career, you've been to many places, including Mexico. So among all these places, when you wake up in the morning, which place resonates you to home like uh, feeling when you think about it? Well, the only home is the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. I couldn't live anywhere else. I've lived in Latin America. I've lived in dozens of places. But frankly, the only place is home. But you, the Washington DC, I happened to get there at the age of 13 because my father was posted. The India and Pakistan had a dispute on the rivers of the waters of the Punjab, and the World Bank was the mediator it was because it was going to give the money for the irrigation uh, projects in both the countries. You had the rivers starting in India but flowing into Pakistan, so they had to settle, settle that. And my father, on the very first day, he arrived in Washington, and he faced 125 lawyers from Pakistan. And from Indian side, there were three engineers. And the president of World Bank told the, very politely told the Pakistanis, please send the 125 lawyers back and bring three engineers, because we're going to sit down with the maps of the rivers to decide the irrigation schemes for these, and on that basis, the Indus Water Treaty. Anyway, it was one of the few treaties between India and Pakistan, peacefully done without a war. But on my first days in high school, in Washington, D.C. This is, mind you, Eisenhower. That, that was in 1955. 55. 55. 5, 5, 55. Yes. We arrived in Washington, D.C. Eisenhower before the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And my mother finds that I'm way ahead of my class in Theodore Roosevelt High School, a public school in Washington. And she goes to the deputy principal, who's a redneck. And she says to him, look, give him a test. This boy is way ahead of his class. And uh, put him either in the next class or at least in the college prep section. They had put me in the vocational section. We had five sections in my class. And so the principal looks at the color of my skin, and he says, welcome to America, son. And he says, 
uh, in, uh, in America, colored boys don't get too big for their boots. So you work hard, stay out of trouble, you'll get a diploma after four years, and there are factories opening up in Virginia and Maryland, and you'll get a good factory job. American dream. Mm -hmm. Welcome to America. So this was before the Rosa Park? This is before the civil rights movement mm -hmm. in America. And uh, uh, soon after, I used to play ping pong, table tennis. And the school sent me for a table tennis tournament to Alabama. Just before my match, I had to pee. And so I was looking for a toilet. I rushed out. And I saw two toilets, whites, mm -hmm. and I saw coloreds. And for a second, I wasn't sure. But then I said, I won't take any chances. I went into coloreds. <clears throat> and I came out feeling very funny, this situation, you know? The, and, and, uh, but <clears throat> I got used to it. In fact, and in your book, you have, you have mentioned about this uh, uh, similar issue with the uh, bottle spinning game you had in the yeah, palace. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, and I think there you had an advantage over everyone else. Well, can you can you please yeah. share with the so, audience? So uh, a few months later, one of the liberal girls in our school, she had a birthday party, and she invited both colored boys and girls and white. Uh, and she invited me as well. And, uh, and so we got lots of good food to eat. That was really great. I mean, the food is, and I stuffed myself. And then we sat down. At that time, very popular game amongst teenagers was spin the bottle. I don't know if any of you know it, but basically you sit around the room and one person spins a bottle and it, where the bottle, head of the bottle, comes facing. Nearest to that, you get to kiss the person of the opposite sex. And in the unwritten rule in this game, at this, on this uh, occasion, was that Black boys kissed black girls, and white boys got to kiss white girls, similarly the other way around. But when it came my turn, everybody was confused. What was I going to do? <laughs> but I solved the problem instantly. I kissed black girls, and I kissed white girls, and I kept <laughs> getting bonus points, and I kept, I kept kissing all evening long, and, <laughs> and I found the secret of life. Right. So um, while... But just one second, though. Mm -hmm. One thing about this experience of living in... And, you know, I was put in a vocational section. So we had a class. It was called shop. And since it was a shop, and we learned with, to work with our hands. We learned carpentry, we learned to fix the radio, and so on. And when my mother discovered what was I learning in school, she said, hi, hi. Only the low caste people in India do these things. So it was in a mess. You see, I came from Punjab. And a Punjabi middle class, because it was a border state, we had six Muslims, Hindus, and so we grew up without much awareness of caste. So it was really in America that I discovered caste mm -hmm. in this racial society. So America was preaching equality and practicing inequality and segregation. And that's something that was happening in India all the time, which I was not aware of. So you had this, uh, during this time, you also mentioned about having a dilemma of what you were taught by your father and your mother. Your father always, it was life versus living. Your father wanted you to have a good life, and your mother wanted you to have a good living. 
So, um, uh, yeah, yeah so just... that, that began actually also in kindergarten. Um, so when we finished the school uh, in 1947, March, I came home sporting a report card, running home, and my mother standing at the door, and she says, did you come first? She knows it's a report card. And my father is standing behind her, and he says, that was the wrong question. Ask him, what does he enjoy in school? Does he like to draw? Does he like to re recite poems? What does he like? Who are his friends? Anyway, these were the two influences in my life. So which did you pursue in life? Well, Life or living? Well, both, because my mother, you know, we were a middle-class family, and she was the mother of a middle-class child, and she knew this boy had to make a living. And so she was making sure I studied and did well in school so that I'd get a job one day. But my father was uh, more relaxed, and he thought in terms of making a life. And this happened, and suddenly, let's fast forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I must tell you, in that high school in Washington, I got my revenge against the principal. I stood at the top of my class at, after four years, and I got scholarships to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. And that was quite unusual in that school. Um, and, 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 and so I was called to, this, to the principal's office. And uh, he's reading the Washington Post. And there's a story about me on page five with my picture. And he's going, he's reading. And he said, and I, and I, and he says, well, son, you made us proud. And you know, he says nice things to me. And at that time, I wanted to tell him his idea of the American dream for me. But I was too much of a gentleman mm -hmm. to say anything. <laughs> or maybe I got frozen, like I got frozen that day with iron. Anyway, so I land, I come home for the summer. My mother is saying goodbye to me at Palom Airport in Delhi. And I'm about to take an Air India flight to Boston and uh, to go to Harvard. And she says, now she's got tears in her eyes. And between those tears, she's saying, now you better study something useful. <laughs> you have to make a living one day to get a job. Why don't you be like your father? He's an engineer. There are jobs going for engineers. So fine, I arrive at Harvard, and I see the course catalog. Mm -hmm. And it blows my mind. I totally forget my mother's advice. And for the next two years, what do I study? Greek tragedy, a Russian novel, history of capitalism, Bauhaus architecture, Renaissance painting, Beethoven music, and Sanskrit love poetry. And my mother, when she hears that I'm studying Sanskrit at Harvard, she says, hi, hi. <laughs> a dead language. Only the dead will give him a job now. <laughs> anyway, by the third year, even Harvard is now getting a little worried. And her, the dean calls me in and says, son, you got to declare a major. And so I have to give a major. And he says, you've got to take courses in that major, and you've got to write a thesis. And so I say philosophy. I'll be my major. I've taken a course already in philosophy. And so that, So uh, I'll just, let me just so the add on uh, to this. Uh, well, when you are selecting your subjects, and um, it just depends on the kind of motivation that you receive in life, right? So it's basically, I'll just connect it to three types of motivation and three subjects you studied. 
you studied, you did major in philosophy, and then you also studied economics and politics in college. And these three, com the combination of three is quite weird to me because when you talk about the, uh, one of the theory of motivation tells people's motivation is based on three needs. One is the need for affiliation, which is close to philosophy understood. One is for achievement, which is uh, close to um, economics. And the other is for power, it's for, it goes to, with politics. And you seem to have juggled all these three things quite well in life, with your profession and throughout your life. So how, what keeps you going and what is the main source of motivation for you? What, it's not three, dear boy. I just told you, Greek tragedy, <laughs> Sanskrit love poetry. And, and, and so, you know, I was telling you, the dean calls me in and he says, so I was talking to the dean and he says, I said, philosophy. I, but he said, why did you choose philosophy? I said, I want to learn about happiness. Good answer, he says. Anyway, I graduated. That, was, that, was, that stayed, or stayed with you because in kindergarten, when you were asked by your kindergarten teacher what you want to be in life, and then you had said, I want to be happy when you were, when you were three years old or four years old. Yeah. So that stayed on for your entire life, that yeah. ambition. And you'll see when I go for my first job, and those guys, my interviewer, wants to know why I want to, you know, which department I want to work in. And he says, what's your objective in life? I said, to be happy. Anyway, I still am seeking that. So it's not... <laughs> so that ambition is still yet to be fulfilled. Still fulf okay. unfulfilled. So um, now moving to a professional, professional career. But bef yeah, yeah so, please. so just I was just saying, so I graduated in philosophy mm -hmm. and um, I got a scholarship to go to Oxford to do a PhD. And I'm back home in Chandigarh and my... Uh, uh, one evening, I asked myself, do I really want to spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought? No. I want a life of action. And so I wrote back to Oxford that I wasn't coming. And my mother's worst nightmare was realized. She had a grown-up son at home without a job. And we had a nosy neighbor in Chandigarh who used to ask my mother every day, Thoda munda ki kar rea. what is your son doing? And she gets embarrassed each time. And she does. She's, she, she says, I don't know. And so to save her embarrassment, and I'm answering your question, mm -hmm. how the professional career began. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I answered so, the first... So your first job was, was with Richard, Richardson Hindustan? Yeah, but I answered the first ad that appeared in the newspaper to save my mother embarrassment. And so it was a company that made Vicks vapor rub, mm -hmm. you know, for colds and coughs and all. And um, she... Um, and the interviewer, I told you, at, for the, at, during the interview, asked me, what's your objective in life? Now, he's expecting me to say, you know, it's marketing or finance or production or whatever. And I told him to be happy. And so that same question gets repeated. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think I didn't know what a trainee was. That's what the job was for. But they must have got impressed with my Harvard degree. And so I got the job, and overnight, I was from the ivy-covered halls at Harvard. I'm walking the dusty bazaars of India mm -hmm. with a bag so was, in my this hand. This was in the 60s. It was 63 right. when I finished. And I'm walking the dusty bazaars, talking to wholesalers and retailers, pharmacists. Ek dozen lena hai ka do dozen lena hai of VIX. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a change. Uh, in, in life. So talking about VIX, VIX has a, uh, even I'm sure with, uh, it, I share that feeling with a lot of people in this, uh, by contemporary people in this hall. We have a lot of nostalgic memories with VIX, especially with 
when in the 80s when you were going to cinemas before the television arrived here and before there was color television, we used to have these color advertisements. I'm quite fascinated with the advertisements. And this, I, among many advertisements, among few advertisements that were good that we remember from those times, there were three that was made of fix. One was with Galemic Hitchkits. Galemic Hitchkits was with, uh, with the Vicks, with that amazing animation that we are not used to. And then there was this little girl and father story. And then there was, I think that was Jugal Hamsaraj, which comes uh, sneezing, saying, happy birthday, mummy. And then this week's vapor of the uh, Malam. So that was the second one. And the third one is we, we, we used to watch this uh, when we were in theaters and cinema halls. Then all of a sudden, there's a, uh, there's a scene of a, of a cinema hall where someone is sneezing, and there was, there was um, the advertisement of fix inhaler. So these three advertisements really it still makes me in, uh, it still makes me nostalgic. nostalgic. So can you tell us since you were there during the during, during the making of this time and that was the time when Vix really made it to the market and became a big company. It was I think by then it was Procter and Gamble already. Well, by then. So can you tell us the background of the story? Yeah, briefly? the I mean India had made the larger. It was a gross. It was an American company. Which was we, are, we always thought it was an Indian company. Well, that's we, what I was I, going At to least say. I thought it was an Indian company. No, in fact, uh, it was an American company which sold products in 135 countries. But India had made the biggest business mm -hmm. of Wix in the world. And when Indians used to go abroad, they thought that it's exported from India. That they are, oh, it's available. It's also, it also must have come from India. Anyway, the... The, I think the most, the memory of Wix for, that I have, Kiran, is there was a flu one year. And we sold a hell of a lot of Wix. Children, parents, mothers. And those were the days in India of our socialist economy and which we called the License Raj. It was a command economy, and the company had a license to produce only so many tons of wicks per year. And during this epidemic, we sold 30% more than our license allowed, allowed us to. And so we, while we were celebrating what a successful year we had had. We got a summons from the government. And it said that you've broken the law. And the and their summons was to uh, come and explain. Uh, it was a notice. And my boss was away to, uh, the, to the states. So I was the point person. And the lawyer who brought the summons to me, show cause. And he, he said, I'd have to go to Delhi now to explain. And so I arrived in Delhi at the office of the Joint Secretary, who was a very arrogant man, a leftist. Uh, first, he kept us waiting, us meaning there were two lawyers with me waiting outside his office for two hours. And then he, we were shown into his office, and he was reading the newspaper. And he didn't look at us. We went and sat down. And after a while, he put the paper down. And he said, Kya, what do you want? I said, sir, you have asked us here. You tell us. And he says, no, no, I haven't read your file. What, what is it? So I explained to him that we, there was a flu, and we thought we had produced for the country, help children, mothers, parents, during an epidemic. And, but we produced more than our license. Aha, he says. So you broke the law. I said, yes. And you know the penalty. I said, yes. And then it was very clear that he was one of those persons who was very anti-business. And he, particularly multinational companies, 
in his conversation, he mentioned East India Company once or twice. And then he uh, says, well, I'm sorry, you broke the law. And I want to make an example of you guys in the private sector. You always, you're always breaking the law. And um, I want to tell you, tell, 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 tell everybody that this is not how we operate in this country. We have a rule of law. And I'm sorry, but now the law will take its course. Suddenly, I get scared. I'm going to go to jail. And uh, so as I'm, and then he says peremptorily, jiao, meaning get out of his office. And uh, so the lawyers get up. They're shivering by now. And we all line up to go out. And then I turn around, and I asked him, I said, sir, you know that this news will get out. It's not every day that a manager of a multinational company goes to jail anywhere. And we are an American company, so it will be appear in the Washington Post, New York Times, etc. And what do you think the world will think of us, of our country, of our prime minister, of you, that you sent someone to jail who produced for the country, helped keep shelves full during an epidemic? What will, it, what will we look like? And he says, are you threatening me? I said, no. I'm just telling you this will happen. And he says, yeah. Anyway, I had sleepless nights, but the government dropped the inquiry. So nothing happened. But that day, I changed from a socialist to a libertarian or a liberal, classical liberal. And I joined the Swatantra Party. And the next election, I worked for the Swatantra Party from that day onwards. Mm -hmm. So that was my so, conversion. So uh, taking from there, like during the last elections, you always keep on telling yourself, you always keep on writing about yourself uh, as being a liberal and a secular person. Uh, but then in the last elections, you went on to endorse Modi for the elections. So isn't that an irony for a liberal and secular person to, yeah, how, do it, you, how, do you, how do you take it? Yeah, well, I can tell you, it was not easy. Um, I, because I had criticized, in the, during the two, I was writing a column. I quit the corporate world uh, at 50 mm -hmm. and became a writer. And By I, the way, I, I when got, you decided to quit in 1995, what is the reaction of your mother? When you said <laughs> you want to quit an international job? She, she, she suddenly, her only thought was, where is he going to get this? Where is the salary check going to come from <laughs> next month? But you know, my wife, who's a Nepali, she was a good sport, and we came back to India. At that time, I was at the world headquarters. Mm -hmm. I'd already become head of the company in right. India. Mm -hmm. and gone there to manage strategic planning. Anyway, the, the point was, you asked me about Modi. Yes. And 2002 Gujarat riots occur. And a lot of criticism against Modi. And I wrote some very strong piece. By then, from 97 onwards, I had a newspaper. I was writing a month, a weekly column for the Times of India which became bi-weekly and then monthly. And so <clears throat> I criticized Modi. And of course, I was considered on the other side. Uh, and, and, and then the Congress came back to power in, this was during um, 2002, I mean, Bajpai was the prime minister. and. Uh, I, I had been basically mostly a Congress voter all, along all these years, but I was very critical of Modi. Then 
the Congress government came to power for two terms. And, particular, and the Manmohan Singh was the prime minister. And I felt let down by Manmohan Singh because he's the guy who had done the reforms right. in 91, which had given us economic freedom. I mean, for 40 years, India was not economically free. We only got our freedom in 91, not in, 19, not in 1947, as people believe. And Manmohan Singh was a hero. Anyway, he becomes prime minister. We all expect more reforms. I used to wait for an announcement to write my weekly column. It didn't come. So we didn't get reforms, but those were good years in our economic history. We, India grew 8% 8, 8 on the average. But the second term of the Congress was filled with corruption. And we were all disgusted at the time. Not only did, the, for me, not only was that the betrayal that the reforms had not taken place, but the corruption had come on top of it. And frankly, I just, and I just could not vote for the Congress. And, and frankly, no, we had not had any riot after 2002. So I thought maybe, well, Modi has learned and, and, his, and his rhetoric was so fresh. He talked about, I mean, to a liberal, it was like music to hear him say, maximum governance, minimum government. I mean, that's really wonderful. Anyway, I believed that rhetoric. And I was one of the first liberals who endorsed him publicly in my columns. And of course, in 2002, I had lost all my friends on the right. In 2014, I lost all my friends on the left when I endorsed Modi. So you've become more free now? Well, free. You don't need to, you don't need to please anyone. But lonely. <laughs> and that situation exists until today. So is that the, another kind of freedom you got? Yeah, I mean, the, what, what happened then, of course, is I got disillusioned with uh, Modi. I began with demonetization, which I thought was rubbish. But anyway, they did some, there were some good things also that happened. But this business of Hindu Rashtra, I'm sorry, I don't buy that. Because you, uh, in one of the debates that I, that I heard you speak, you had mentioned about in democracy, we are left with choosing between the idiots and the people who think you are idiots. Is that the share of democracy we have here now? And that was at the Oxford Union. Yes. That we had two candidates. One of them I thought was an idiot. Mm. And you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and the other one who thought everyone else was an idiot. So we won't mention names. That was what it was. But the long and short of it is, that I'm in the same place. We had a debate and we had a, I gave a lecture in Delhi uh, at the India International Center uh, last month, which was called The Dilemma of an Indian Liberal. Right. And this was the dilemma. Again, being in a lonely place that the, you can't vote for the left because you don't trust them with the economy and you can't vote for the right because you've, the freedom is being mm -hmm. reduced. Plus, uh, Hindu Rashtra talk is not is not why we elected Mr. Modi. Yeah, one one thing just to connect with with this and the current situation is this uh, because of this dilemma, I guess there is a lot of there is a. Um, fundamentalist group trying to preach religious fundamentalism in both sides of the border, in Nepal and in India as well. And you, as I, as I read you, you seem to have read more religious manuscript than most of the religious people in this part of the subcontinent. But you still say you are a secular person. Is it, pos how, is it possible to remain a secular person and be relig religious? Uh, oh, absolutely. I think, in fact, the Practicing Hindus that I know, starting with my wife, 
my grandmother, they are far more secular than the people who we don't think of as secular. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why? Because what is, I'm, I'm an agnostic, but the average Hindu knows, says that there are 300 million gods, 30 crore gods. We have 30 crore gods, and in the same breath, she says, we have one god. And when you have 300 million gods, no god can afford to feel jealous. So you learn tolerance from day number one. And you know when the, Pez when the British missionaries came to India, and they went to the peasants to convert them to Christianity, the peasants of Bengal said, no problem. We'll make Jesus Christ into one of our gods. And would you like him to be an avatar of Vishnu or Shiva? <laughs> they gave them a choice. And so I think in a country, our temper of India and of the subcontinent and Nepal is essentially a liberal temper. You know, the, the, the holiest, one of the holiest Vedas is the Rig Veda, the first Veda. And in the Rig Veda, they ask, well, how was the cosmos created? And uh, one, of, one person says, well, it was dark. There was no one, no being. So, you know, how can we know? Maybe we should ask the gods. And the answer comes, oh, but the gods came afterwards. So gods won't know how was the universe created. Well, then maybe let's ask the Brahmins. Oh, no, Brahmins are always fighting with each other. We'll just get confused. And so they conclude in the holiest text that maybe we don't know. Now, that's a liberal answer. And so the temper of our subcontinent is liberal. And so I feel the shelf life of Hindutva, Hindu Rashtra, is a very limited one. Like with this book, you've called this, this is a memoir you would like to call, but I think it's, it could be called an autobiography. So uh, one thing is, why did you call, uh, choose to call it a memoir than an autobiography, the one? The other is, this becomes, this becomes the fourth in what you call it the quartet of your four books. The first one was India Unbound, you call it Artha, and then Difficulty of uh, Being Good, which you call it Dharma, and then Kama, the riddle of desire, and then the fourth one, this one you, you uh, prefer to call it moksha. So why do you prefer to call it uh, a memoir? And if you were given an opportunity to re-sequence these four books, would you re-sequence it or leave it as it is? And, and then while you are talking about moksha, you may want to also share about, you have, you have uh, very, very interestingly I, um, defined moksha in a, in a moksha in a non, in a secular way. So what is secular moksha and what is non-secular moksha? Okay. Very quickly, why is this a memoir and not an autobiography? <laughs> well, most people don't know the difference. Uh, but the difference is autobiography talks about I was born here, then I did this, then I did this, I went to this school, then I did this work, I got married, and then I died. So it's one thing after another. A memoir. A memoir forces you to select. Where a memoir finds a theme, you've got all these unconnected dots of your life, and in a memoir, you try to connect the dots. And that's how I connected the dots to this title, Another Sort, this freedom. And I'm going to tell you why it's this called 
another sort of freedom. So <clears throat> in a memoir, you select. And when you start selecting, then of course you are playing God. You are deciding your life. And I can tell you one secret. I've learned this because when you, when you write a memoir or an autobiography, you have to, you relive, you relive your life. And what I've learned is that reliving your life is better than living it. So go back, go back and relive your life. Now, be careful, because the tendency of human beings is to make yourself look good. But if you make yourself look good all the time, what will people say? They'll call you a pompous ass. <laughs> then, but then you say, oh my god, I must make myself look bad. But if you make yourself look bad all the time, they'll say, oh, he's a bloody loser. Why should I read his book? Now, you want to make your book interesting, so you choose interesting parts of your life. But don't make it too interesting either, because they won't believe it. So be yourself. That's the, that's the lesson in writing a memoir. Now, about your question about moksha. moksha. Secular and non-secular. So the theme of this book is actually the four, the Purushartha, as we call it, is the fourth Artha Dharma Kama Moksha. And actually, this Purushartha, it wasn't planned that way. It just turned out that way, because I write each book because it helps me to solve a problem. People solve problems in different ways. I do it by writing books. And the first problem I faced was the question of poverty in our part of the world. And so I wrote India Unbound, which I learned how to, I mean, in which was about how to make a poor country rich. And, and, uh, it, it, and in fact, it, uh, I was the first one to predict the rise of India. India obliged by rising. And so <clears throat> prosperity began to spread in India. But as prosperity was spreading, so was corruption. And that's what made me go to dharma and write the difficulty of being good. Uh, and as, I, as you know, I studied Sanskrit mm -hmm. at uh, Harvard. So I had the confidence to attack the Mahabharat. And because Mahabharat is obsessed with dharma. Anyway, the third problem was desire. I think we all suffer from desire. I do, at least. And so I learned a lot about writing about the karma phase. Now the fourth in the Purusharthas is called moksha. Now people think moksha is a spiritual thing. At the end of your life, freedom. And it's a freedom from birth and rebirth. And frankly, it's a spiritual objective. But for a person who is secular, worldly, and who cannot make the leap of faith. But yet, I was deeply influenced by, the, by Buddhism, where they, they don't have the notion of God. And the notion, it's anatta, you know, no, no atma, and so on. We won't get to go into that. But anyway, my point is that um, this, the freedom this other sort of freedom is the going back to the original meaning in Sanskrit of moksha, which just means free. We say, if you pay your debts, mukti ho gai. A person comes out of jail, he's moksha. And a horse without a harness is free. And so the freedom I talk about is the freedom from expectations. Expectations of the family, of your friends, of oneself. 
we all have expectations, and the worst expectations of those of our egos. We all want to be, I mean, want to be uh, somebody rather than nobody. We all want to get premium treatment when we go to a counter, you know. Uh, and, and that sense which leads to vanity, status, anxiety, envy, all the things that we are aware of, problems the ego. So freedom is freedom from that, freedom from one's expectations. With this, I would like to quote the last two words of your book, which says, what next? Since you are a very disciplined writer, I know you have been, you have been writing since this book has gone to press as well. So what next, as a reader, should we expect from you? Well, you know, I told you I gave this lecture in Delhi uh, called The Dilemma of an Indian Liberal. And the publisher thought it was a great title for a book, a quick book before it comes out, before the election. And so that's what it what's, looks like. It's a long essay, short, slim volume called The Difficulty of I mean, not the difficulty, but the dilemma of an Indian liberal. And actually, I've told you what that dilemma yes. basically is. Okay, thank you. It was a, uh, I think, um, thank you for, the comp for your thoughts. You. And there's one line in your, there's a one line in your book I'd like to borrow, which says, uh, telling a true story from one's perspective is also contributing to the data of history. So thank you for contributing to history from your perspective. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being so patient. Thank you, Sujeev and Beat, for having me here. And thank you. And thank you for, thank you for all thank you. for coming. Thank you, thank you Sujeev, for organizing it. And Kiran. <laughs>